Funding for Chasing the Dream is provided by JPB Foundation and the Ford Foundation. Why it's so hard to get ahead in Columbus, next. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance and for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. The construction cranes tell part of the story. Columbus is one of the fastest growing cities in the Midwest. While other major cities in Ohio lose residents or struggle to hang on to the ones they have, Columbus's population has risen 9.3%. Tech jobs are popping up everywhere, so are the new apartment complexes. But for all of its success, more and more Columbus residents find it harder and harder to achieve the dream of financial security. Columbus has one of the nation's widest income gaps. A 2015 University of Toronto study found Columbus is the second most economically segregated city in the United States. It has been ranked as among the least promising places for low-income children to climb out of poverty. So what's going on here? Why are so many of the city's residents trapped economically? Through Chasing the Dream, a national public media initiative, WOSU is exploring poverty and opportunity in Columbus. This Columbus Neighborhoods is part of an ongoing public media reporting initiative called Chasing the Dream, Poverty and Opportunity in America. We're taking an in-depth look at the contemporary state of the American dream, the changing nature of jobs, the vanishing middle class, wage disparity, and economic opportunity. Here in Columbus, we're working with reporters from 89.7 NPR News to look at how health, housing, and transportation issues prevent people from getting a foothold in the middle class. Everyone who works for a living knows that sometimes you just gotta smile and do your job. But people with poor dental health have fewer opportunities to get a better job or move up. Esther Honig tells us about the surprising and far-reaching problems caused by poor dental health. Connie Seymour is a mother of 10 and has spent the last 35 years working as a server. She says cost and getting time off from work have prevented her from seeing a dentist in the last two years. If you're not making enough to live on as it is, getting to the dentist is not a priority. Eating, paying your bills, getting to work every day, those are priorities. Connie is one of 74 million Americans who lack dental insurance. That's three times the number of people who lack health insurance. She doesn't make enough to afford the insurance, but she makes too much to qualify for Medicaid. Two years without a dentist have left her teeth in bad shape. You have to pay for the dentist appointment. You have to pay for, you know, whatever happens. And it wasn't something that I could afford to do. So I just went on without the fillings. So now it came down to the point where I had to have the teeth pulled. Some clinics, like Primary One, offer discounted services for patients without insurance. Connie went to one of Columbus's only free clinics, Physician Care Connection, where she had three teeth pulled and a bracket for false teeth repaired. Eventually, she'll need another set of false teeth. I mean, I'm missing almost the whole bottom row on this side. So, I mean, that 
that prevents me from eating some of the things that other people get to eat. So what prevents people like Connie from seeing a dentist? Data from the CDC shows that lower income neighborhoods like Linden report the highest rates of tooth loss in the city at around 40 to 50 percent. Now, just as many residents report not having gone to the dentist in the last year, and that has a lot to do with being able to physically and financially access a dentist's office. Throughout Columbus, the poorest neighborhoods shown here in white have the fewest dental clinics. The yellow dots represent dental clinics. And in the North and South Linden neighborhoods, there are only four. And none of them offer affordable services for patients without insurance. Compare that to more affluent areas where there are nearly two dozen dentists. In Clintonville, just 6% of residents report tooth loss and nearly everyone has seen a dentist in the last year. I think people in, in poor communities struggle with, with physically accessing care. I know we talk often to patients that come to the school, you know, was it easy to get here? And for some it isn't. Transportation. You know, if you don't have your own vehicle or if you're not on a bus line, it's hard to get from A to B to C to get to the dentist. That's a, just a physical issue. At the OSU College of Dentistry, patients can receive care from dental students at a fraction of the normal cost. As the only state-supported dental school in Ohio, patients travel from all over seeking root canals, dentures, and preventative care. Oftentimes, people who struggle to afford preventative services only see a dentist once an issue has become severe. Last year, 60% of Americans that went to see a dentist went because they hurt. Not because they wanted their teeth white, not because they wanted braces, not because they had a broken tooth, but it was pain. Many of these patients wind up in the emergency room. In 2012, a patient came to the ER every 15 seconds for a dental emergency that could have been treated at a dentist's office. There are more medical clinics than there are dental clinics for folks. So it's a very complex issue. Uh, and I think importantly, it's even more complex when we're talking about prevention. Mount Carmel often sees people seeking dental care at their mobile clinic, and they have to refer them elsewhere. Pearson says poor dental hygiene contributes to more serious issues down the road. So it puts people at higher risk for cardiovascular issues like stroke and heart attack. And um, I, I really believe that um, a person who loses um, their teeth as a re result of periodontal disease and doesn't have access to dentures is really dealing with a disability. And um, on top of all of the things that you might see, um, nutritional challenges will definitely exist because finding healthy foods that one can eat when you don't have teeth is a real challenge. And a damaged smile can make it hard to find a job. Employers are looking fo for folks that in, in their minds and in their perception will represent their organizations well. So most definitely when somebody comes in with um, issues of poor oral hygiene or they're missing teeth, it, it impedes their ability to gain employment and maintain employment. If you're missing enough uh, of your front teeth in particular, your, your pronunciation isn't quite what it should be. If you're missing all of your teeth and you haven't replaced them somehow, the, the support underneath the lips it goes away and your whole outside falls in and, and can make you look 40 years older than you really are. Connie knows that when you're looking for work in the service industry, appearance is everything. Especially with the job that I do, when they come in and they're missing teeth or they're just in bad shape, I see management not taking them because of that appearance, which is unfair, but I get it. People like Connie need to see a dentist in order to make a living, but they don't always make enough to afford a dentist. When I smile, that's the first thing I think about is, wow, they probably think I didn't take care of me. And it's not about not taking care of me. You know, there's rent, there's utilities, there's car payments, there's insurance, there's gas you put in your car to go back and forth to work, there's food. Even though I'm out there working and it looks like I should be banking, I'm struggling. Um, um, I'm past struggling right now. Housing is the single biggest expense for many people in Columbus, especially those who are in lower paying jobs. Even if they get a better paying job, it may not be enough if their housing costs go up. Adora Namigade takes us to one neighborhood that is on the rise and the problem that presents for some of its residents. 
Wineland Park is a neighborhood on the rise, but that's a good and bad thing. Let's start with Michelle Person. She's 30 years old and has lived in community properties of Ohio housing for six years. When I moved in here, I did my first cartwheel. I haven't did in years. <laughs> Person pays $71 a month in rent in a subsidized apartment. She likes the area, but is debating whether she wants to move out. I do need another space, a bigger place. What's keeping you from moving up? Money. I don't have the income that I should. I don't work. My job is taking care of my son. Moving would take her away from the many social services readily available in her neighborhood. I would not have no help from the Gamagil because they have all types of different kind of help. Job information, GED information. They do um, fruits and vegetables around here too. Resources that were not always around when person was growing up. I used to live down the street when I got kicked out of my house on my 18th birthday. This neighborhood was bad. They changed this neighborhood a lot. Wineland Park, like many low-income areas, has seen big changes. The neighborhood dates back to the 1890s when it began as a streetcar suburb. Manufacturing plants employed a lot of people from the 1940s to the 70s. Residents had good jobs with decent incomes. The neighborhood was stable. But then came globalization. The factories closed, the jobs left. In the 80s, as people moved out, gangs moved in, and crime increased. Kia Linville recalls her childhood in the 90s. It was, it was terrible. I literally seen someone get killed right there on the corner, and it made me not want to live out here no more. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Michael Wilkos knows Wineland Park and its challenges well. In his role with the Columbus Foundation, he led its work to revitalize the neighborhood. He lives in the neighborhood, too. For more than 20 years, this neighborhood has been focused on both the physical redevelopment of the neighborhood and building the capacity of folks who live here. The city of Columbus and nearby Ohio State University formed campus partners and led the work to improve the neighborhood. Wilkos took me around to show me the results of the campus partners' intervention. If you go back to as recently as 2010, there were 14 either abandoned or highly distressed homes on this short block between 6th Street and 7th. Now we're down to just one vacant house. According to the 2010 census, 20% 20 of Wineland Park's homes were abandoned. That's down to 4% today. Linville, who lives with her young son, daughter, and mother, likes the changes. Now it's like it's super quiet, it's peaceful, it's not really much going on here. Linville doesn't make much money. She's picked up some hours at a nearby Goodwill, and she qualifies for a subsidized rent-free apartment. But she wants to move to a better place. Why can't you move up? Uh, because I don't, I really don't have a job right now, like a stable job. So it's best that I stay here until I get a better job. A key component of the Wineland Park project is housing diversity. A prime example is a project going up on Grant Avenue. At least 500 new housing units are being built on the spot where the Columbus Coated Fabrics factory once stood. It will feature a mix of low-income subsidized rental homes and owner-occupied market rate homes. Wyland Park is one of those unique neighborhoods that has a historic pattern of being racially integrated. It also is income integrated because it has this variety of different housing stock. Wilkos says the variety of housing stock encourages understanding and hopefully creates stability. Public agencies have provided grant money for residents to fix up their homes. I met a resident who received a grant from the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission. Diane Dixon has lived in the same house all her life. My dad came here after World War II and then he married my mother after he met her at um, Tempe and Roland Berry and they've been here ever since. Dixon's daughter, brother, godparent, and grandchild all live on the same street. So why did you decide to fix up your house versus moving away from the neighborhood? This is my home. This is where I grew up. There's history here. My mother died in my house of dementia. My dad worked hard to get each of us a home. I don't think I should have to move. I don't want to go anywhere. I want to stay where there, there's ability, where I have friends. I want my grandson to have the same values and love that I had for this neighborhood. But a downside to the revitalization looms, gentrification. 
As neighbors fix up their homes and the neighborhood becomes more attractive, more affluent people move in. Property tax went up and that I'm on disability now, the threat of me not being able to pay my property tax scares me a lot. The changes cause her to feel unwelcome in the only home she's known. I get so many offers in the mail and phone calls constantly. Do you want to sell your house? Do you want to sell your house? I'm not interested in selling. I don't believe I should be taxed out of my home that I grew up in. Wilco says a big challenge in stabilizing neighborhoods and achieving the dream of financial stability is helping people in the middle. So let's say you live in subsidized housing and you're looking to make the jump to a market rate home. Is there anything available for people in between that gap? How do you make the jump? So I think you are asking a question that is probably one of the most critical questions we as a nation have to solve. And that is, it has been our federal and state and even local government providing a subsidy to some of the most vulnerable families. And in this neighborhood, we've brought many of those programs to bear, from Habitat to Humanity to what many people refer to as Section 8 housing. Wilco says possible solutions include land trusts and tax abatements. We have to look at tools that we have yet to apply in the neighborhood to keep this long-term and mixed-income community. Then there's the challenge of long-term stability. What happens when you make enough money to move out of subsidized housing? Do you take that chance? Let's say your job is more stable, or let's say you're working two jobs and you have more income, and so you have the ability to leave that housing product with a subsidy and move into the open market. What happens if you lose that second job and you want to go back into some of those programs that you had been living in previously, there's a several year wait list. Conquering the cost of housing is probably the biggest hurdle to achieving the dream of financial security. Experts will watch Wineland Park and its residents to see if it can be a model for others. Often we think the answer to getting ahead is to get a good job, but getting to that job can be part of the problem. Many of Columbus's lowest paid workers don't own cars, and when they get a chance for a better job, they have to figure out a commute in a city with limited transportation choices. Debbie Holmes shows the long road to a better living that many people face. One in five African-American commuters in Columbus do not own a car. Like single mother Anita Ross Vanis of Linden, most of them rely on public transportation. Well, I catch the bus. Sometimes it's delayed and sometimes it's packed. At 10.14 a.m., Anita catches her first bus along Cleveland Avenue. The average commute time by car in Columbus is 20 minutes. Anita's commute is four times longer. She makes $9 an hour as a home health care aide and spends $4.50 every day on bus fare. Without the bus system, could you get to work? No, because you can't rely on people to take you to work every day. So you've got quite a few buses. You have to take three buses, right, to get to work? Yes. So tell me about that, how long it takes. About an hour, 15 minutes, hour and a half. Plus it's extra babysitting expenses. Yes. Yeah, you got to pay the babysitter. So if I'm only working five hours a day, I end up paying for eight hours of child care. Majority of my money goes towards the child care and a bus pass. And then the rest will go on utilities and food or whatever I need for the house or for my kids. You just have to do what you gotta do. I mean, if I don't work, then my kids can't be taken care of, so I have to work so I can still provide for them. So is the money enough to do what you need to do at home? Not really. For the working poor, getting ahead means getting to work on time every day. Without a car, choices are limited on where they live and what jobs they take. Yeah, that was part of one of my reasons why I moved here, because I always wanted to be on the bus line. Any job I've ever worked, I've always um, worked bus line. Being a single mom, anywhere we ever lived, it had to be bus line. But for many, jobs are a moving target. What really used to be kind of the bread and butter jobs of the middle class economy, um, they are seeing their employment opportunities kind of push further and further out uh, into some of the exurbs uh, and really out to the farther parts of the region. 
Jobs are moving out of the city and into places like Groveport, where distribution centers lay a mile beyond the nearest Coda bus stop. So we needed effective ways to get people to the area. Coda was doing everything that they could do uh, to get folks down here. Uh, but one of the real obstacles was this last mile transportation. A grade came along uh, as part of Groveport and the Rickenbacker community. They have a shuttle service they provide where they pick up associates at the Coda bus stops and bring them literally to our front door. So it's made it a lot easier, a lot more accessible. Our budget comes from income tax revenue from the people that work in these businesses. While Groveport's shuttle system is a stopgap solution, the Capitol Crossroads Special Improvement District has gained international attention by offering free bus passes to workers in downtown Columbus. Yeah, the property owners right now have agreed to place an assessment, a mandatory assessment on their property to help raise $4.5 million over two and a half years to pay for unlimited access for roughly 45,000 employees in downtown. And that'll do a couple of things, one of, one of which is it will help low-income employees so they can, they can work downtown without the stress of paying for the commuting. It also helps employers who report that they, they either get turned down when they offer a job to a low-income worker or they hire and train somebody who ends up leaving when they discover they can't afford to commute into downtown. And, and under this plan, anyone who works in these buildings that are covered by this special improvement district can ride any bus at any time for free. As cities across the nation look to replicate the initiative, it bears noting that it's not a permanent solution and not all downtown workers get a free pass, only those who work in the buildings that fund it. On a larger scale, Coda redesigned its entire route system based on moving people to and from jobs. It's too early to tell if the redesign will work as predicted, and the simple fact is the biggest barrier to climbing out of poverty is finding the money to purchase a car. Cars provide freedom to choose where you live and where you work. It gets you to work on time and gets you to jobs that aren't on the bus line. The shuttles and the free passes, while great initiatives, are seen by some as simply band-aids. We need people to be able to ascertain a decent quality of life and to be paid fairly for what they do. Um, and we need employers to also be able to have sustainable workforces. And if we don't have that, we're always going to be patching our system with band-aids as we try to figure out how do we find enough workers to reach this new opportunity? Um, how do we help folks now who are earning money that barely keeps them above the poverty line? Some days are longer than others and uh, it takes a lot of hustle and bustle. So you got to be ready and always geared up for it. <laughs> it's not so so cool when you're standing in 10 below weather, though. Like many bus riders, Anita walks the last mile of her commute. So now I just have to walk on one side of the street because on the other side it's a real narrow path when cars come, you like get side swiped. And after her shift is over, Anita will walk back to the bus stop and spend another hour and a half getting home. They'll offer me a client, but they're not on a bus route. Or, you know, it might be a two, three hour bus ride. And when you really look at it, it's not really worth it because you're really not making any money after you pay for a babysitter and everything. So I had to really choose who I take care of. Eighty-nine-seven NPR News has done a series of reports on the income gap in Columbus. You can hear these stories by visiting WOSU.org backslash Chasing the Dream. These radio stories and this episode of Columbus Neighborhoods are part of an ongoing public media reporting initiative called Chasing the Dream, Poverty and Opportunity in America. If you miss any of our shows, log on to columbusneighborhoods.org because we post all of our episodes online. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. Little Timmy looks up from the table. Mother Grandma.
glances at him Wishes she was able Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Wartime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.